Hey everybody, Chef Bates here. Welcome back to Serve Safe Chapter 6. So far, we've gone over how to prep our food and how to thaw it. Now it's time to start cooking. The first and most important part of this section has to do with how hot you have to get different types of food to destroy the bacteria that's most likely in that food. Most of these temperatures you're going to have to memorize. There's no easy way to learn how hot chicken must be in order to be safe. We're not talking learning here. We're talking rote memorization. You have to memorize these numbers because the only way to reduce pathogens in food to safe levels is to cook that food to its correct minimum internal temperature. You may say to me, but chef, I don't have to memorize it. I can look it up on my phone. Well, that's possible, I suppose. If you were only cooking one type of food at a time, or you worked somewhere where you could wander around a busy-as-hell kitchen with your phone out trying to look up if pasta needed to be cooked to a specific temperature when it was being served with sausage, let me know how that works for you. For the rest of us, people who like being competent, we have to know the different temperatures each food needs to reach for safety. We also want to know how long we have to hold each of those foods at that specific temperature to kill potential nasties that will make us sick. The FDA recommends cooking food to the minimum internal temperatures that are listed in the next handful of slides. For the next few minutes, please keep this in mind. While cooking can reduce pathogens in food to safe levels, it will not reduce spores or toxins they may have produced. For this reason, it is critical to handle food correctly before it's cooked. So let's start with the foods we have to cook the most, like poultry, which is just a fancy word for chicken, turkey, and duck. Stuffing made with fish, meat, or poultry, like these gorgeous crab stuffed shrimp, they need to come up to the same temperature, 165 degrees for 15 seconds. Stuffed meat, like meatloaf. You didn't know meatloaf was stuffed? That's sad. Of course it's stuffed. It's stuffed with like bread and eggs, onions, all kinds of yumminess. Stuffed seafood, like this beautiful stuffed baked cod. And stuffed poultry, like chicken cordon bleu. Stuffed pasta, like ravioli or lasagna. And all the dishes that include previously cooked TCS ingredients also have to be cooked to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Think Italian wedding soup. It's a good example. It contains previously cooked sausage. Previously cooked TCS foods need to be brought up to 165 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds, regardless of what kind of food it is. We'll talk about that later on when we get to the section on reheating. At 155 degrees Fahrenheit, we're looking at another batch of food. You'll notice that most of this food has been handled or prepped in some way. The beef has been ground, the ham has been brined or injected, the meat has been tenderized. A basic rule of thumb is the more you mess with food, the hotter you have to cook it. It makes sense, right? The pathogen is on the outside of the meat. We grind it up into some delicious hamburger, and all the pathogens which were on the outside are now on the inside. We've got to get it hotter than a steak, because in the process of grinding or tenderizing or brining, we made the meat more susceptible to those pathogens finding a new home. Ever see one of those giant syringe needle-looking things with a bottle of flavor injector at Publix? When you inject flavoring or brine into meat, like this delicious honey-smoked ham, you are increasing the risk of pathogenic growth. Sometimes we grab a hammer and smack the hell out of a tough cut of meat to make it more tender. This is called mechanical tenderizing. If you smack your steak with a hammer and make yourself a delicious country fried steak like this one, you've got to cook it to 155 degrees Fahrenheit and hold it there for 15 seconds. Here's a word you might not know. Ratites. Ratites are large, flightless, delicious birds. They include ostrich and emu, like this ostrich steak that's cooking on my grill. Ah, oh, the smell. Mm. Ground seafood also has to be cooked to 155 degrees for 15 seconds, like this New England-style crab cake sandwich, which is delicious. Lastly, shell eggs that are going to be hot held for service have to be cooked to 155 degrees Fahrenheit and held there for 15 seconds. So if you're going to put a bunch of scrambled eggs on your buffet table at your breakfast joint, you got to cook them to 155. Some smart student's going to ask me, hey, what about pasteurized pooled eggs? How hot do we have to cook those? Well, since pooled eggs that have been pasteurized are technically safe to eat without cooking at all, as long as you aren't feeding a high-risk population, they don't have a temperature requirement. You could, I guess, put pasteurized eggs in a glass and let your guests sip them through a saw. I mean, it would be nasty, but I've seen it done in a couple of bars where raw egg is part of the garnish, which is gross. 
At 145 degrees Fahrenheit, we're talking about more substantial cuts of meat that have less chance of being contaminated because they have been handled less. If this cut of salmon was cut up and turned to a salmon burger, it would have to be cooked to 155. But as long as it's whole, it can be grilled to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature range includes all whole fish, shellfish, and crustaceans. Steaks, chops of pork, beef, veal, and lamb are also cooked to 145 degrees for 15 seconds, like these gorgeous pork chops just begging for a turn in my saute pan with a little sage butter, a touch of garlic, maybe some peppered brown sugar. God, I'm hungry. Commercially raised game, like venison, rabbit, goose, and quail, are in the same temperature category as whole fish and whole cuts of meat. That's 145 degrees Fahrenheit. You might have tried some commercially raised game and not even known that's what you were eating. Fried gator tail is a very popular form of commercially raised game, like this woman is stuffing into her gaping mouth hole. It looks delicious, but God, she can, she's kind of gross. The last food item that needs to be cooked to 145 for 15 seconds is shell eggs that are going to be served right away, immediately, like this omelet that's made to order. Again, if you're using pasteurized shell eggs, you could cook this omelet to a lower temperature. Unpasteurized shell eggs need to be cooked to 145 if they're being served right away, and 155 degrees if they're going to be cooked now and served later. Keep that in mind. That matters. Large roasts have their very own category. A 10-pound cut of beef has to be brought up to 145 degrees Fahrenheit and held there for four whole minutes. Everything else is 15 seconds. This is four minutes. But here's the problem. If you cook a roast that hot, you'll overcook it a lot. The answer? Cook it to a lower temperature and hold it at that temperature for a longer period of time. Now, I know that chart looks overwhelming. You don't have to memorize the whole thing. You just need to memorize the first temperature range and the last one. If you do, you'll be easily able to estimate any middle temperatures. So here's what you do. You memorize 145 degrees Fahrenheit for four minutes, and then at the bottom of the range, 130 degrees Fahrenheit for 112 minutes. Then, whatever the question is, use those two numbers to estimate the answer. For example, let's say you get this question about cooking a leg of lamb on ServeSafe. First, you'd have to recognize the fact that this leg of lamb is a roast, not ground meat or raised game animal like venison. Good. You're going to know it's somewhere in the roast range. Still looks hard, doesn't it? You can eliminate all the wrong answers if you just remember the first and last temperature ranges from the roast page. 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 4 minutes and 130 degrees Fahrenheit for 112 minutes. You might even want to just like write it on a scratch sheet of paper so you know it. Okay, check out the options. You know right away that A is wrong. You hold a roast at 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 4 minutes, not 36. And you know that D is wrong because at the long end of the range, you hold a roast for 112 minutes at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, not 135. And you know that C is wrong because that's a freebie. Nothing's cooked to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. That only leaves one possible answer, B. This is one of those questions that freak people out, but it's actually really easy to answer if you memorize the range, the first and the last numbers. At the bottom of the cooking range is fruits, vegetables, and grains like rice, pasta, oatmeal, and grits, and all the bean products. Please note that you only have to cook these items to this temperature if they're going on a buffet table or are being stored on a steam table and will be hot held to serve later. In many cases, if you are serving these items right away, you don't have to cook them to 135 degrees Fahrenheit because they're considered ready-to-eat foods already. If it can be served raw, you only have to cook it to 135 degrees Fahrenheit if you're going to serve it later or put it on a buffet table. You get the idea. It might seem weird, but there are a couple of bacteria that are associated with brewed iced tea. Coliform, Enterobacter, and E. coli. To avoid them, make sure your tea brewing machine runs at 175 degrees Fahrenheit because the tea has to sit in hot water for a full minute at that degree of temperature to be safe. Gordon Ramsay may hate it, but microwaves are used in all but the fanciest of restaurants. If you are using a microwave in a restaurant or even your house, follow these rules. Cover the food to prevent its surface from drying out. Don't microwave without a lid. It'll splatter to make the inside of your microwave look like a murder scene. Uh, rotate or stir it halfway through the cooking process so that the heat reaches the food more evenly. And this is important. Let the covered food stand for at least two minutes after cooking to let the temperature even out. 
Microwaves work by vibrating the water molecules inside food. The heat then has to spread throughout the food for all of it to get hot. Stir the food frequently to help the process along. When you're done, check the temperature in at least two places to make sure the food is cooked through. We're going to finish up the cooking section by talking about partial cooking, or as it's known in the restaurant business, par cooking, par boiling, par steaming, or par baking. Lots of restaurants partially cook food during prep and then finish cooking it just before service. It allows restaurants to serve food cooked to order in a short period of time because, you know, Americans hate waiting. You're going to have to follow certain steps if you plan to partially cook meat, seafood, poultry, eggs, or any dishes that contain TCS foods. In Florida, the food most commonly associated with par cooking are hamburgers and buffalo wings. Do not cook the food for longer than 60 minutes during initial cooking. So when you're doing the par cooking, the food cannot cook for more than 60 minutes, and then it has to be immediately cooled. After you have par cooked your food, cool the food if it will not be served immediately or held for service using the standard temperature range. 135 degrees to 70 degrees within the first two hours, 70 degrees to 41 degrees Fahrenheit within four hours. You should then freeze or refrigerate your par cooked item at 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, you know, refrigerator temperature. If the foods are going to be refrigerated, store it away from ready to eat food, clearly labeled as a par cooked food item that needs additional cooking to be safe. Don't mix it with other batches of par cooked items and definitely don't store it in the same container as other types of food where it could potentially get confused. When you are ready to finish cooking the item, Heat the food to its required minimum internal temperature before selling or serving it. But you knew that. That just makes sense. Your local regulatory authority or health inspector is going to require you to have written procedures that explain how the food cooked by this process is going to be prepped and stored. These procedures must be approved by the regulatory authority and describe the following things. Okay, how are you going to make sure that all of the people who work for you are prepping the food correctly, that they're par cooking the food correctly. What are you going to do if those requirements aren't met? How are you going to correct the situation? How the food is going to be marked after par cooking to indicate that it needs to be cooked more and how these food items are going to be separated from your ready to eat food during storage once initial cooking is complete. When you don't serve cooked food immediately, you must get it out of the temperature danger zone as quickly as possible. That means cooling it fast. You also need to reheat it correctly, especially if you're going to hold it for later service. As you know, pathogens grow really well in the temperature danger zone, and they grow much faster at temperatures between 125 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Food must pass through this temperature range quickly to reduce the growth of pathogens. Obviously, we're going to cool our TCS food from its cooking temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit to 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower within six hours. We have six hours to get it from the top to the bottom. And it happens in two stages. First, you're going to cool your food from 135 to 70 within the first two hours. The second stage is when you cool it from 70 degrees to holding temperature of 41 in the next four hours. If you can cool your food from 135 to 70 in less than two hours, you can use the remaining time to cool it to 41 degrees. However, the total cooling time cannot be longer than six hours. It can't. For example, uh, let's say you got some lasagna and you're going to get it cool from 135 degrees Fahrenheit to 70. And you, and you actually were able to do that in one hour. You have the remaining five hours to get it down to 41. Remember, and make a note and write it on your wrist with a Sharpie. If the food that you're cooling does not cross the 70 degree threshold in the first two hours, you have to recondition the food. You've got to put it back on the heat. You've got to bring it back to its minimum internal cooking temperature. And then you have to try cooling again. Several factors are going to affect how quickly food will cool. The thickness or the density of the food matters because the denser the food, the more slowly it will cool. You know that. Mashed potatoes cool a lot slower than green beans. A pot roast cools much slower than a single hamburger. Large food items cool more slowly than small items. To get food to cool faster, reduce the size. Cut large food items into smaller pieces. Divide the containers of food into smaller containers or shallow pans. One big pot of tomato soup is going to cool very slowly. Ten small containers of the same soup is going to cool a lot faster. 
While we're talking about storage, it's helpful to remember that some containers hold heat in, like plastic, and others allow heat to escape much quicker, like stainless steel. Stainless steel transfers heat away from food super fast. Use metal containers if at all possible. Also, shallow pans let the heat from food disperse a lot faster than a deep pan. You, know, you, you knew that. You're a smarty. Never cool large amounts of hot food in a refrigerator. Most refrigerators are not designed to cool large amounts of hot food quickly. Since it's not designed to make hot food cold, it's designed to keep cold food cold. Placing a bunch of hot food in a refrigerator may not move the food through the temperature danger zone quickly enough for it to be safe. To chill your food safely, set up an ice water bath. Here's how you do it. After dividing your food into smaller containers, place the containers in a clean prep sink or large pot that's filled with water. Icy water. Stir the food frequently to cool it faster and more evenly. Or you might use an ice paddle. Ice paddles are plastic paddles that are filled with water and then frozen. Food stirred with an ice paddle will cool quite fast. To supercharge the process, hey, combine. Place the food in an ice water bath and stir it with an ice paddle. Smart chefs design their recipes with cooling in mind. It is possible to add ice or cold water as an ingredient after cooking has been completed to cool it. This is especially true with soups or stews, stocks, brines, and many other liquid items. To use this method, the recipe is made with less water than is required. Then cold water or ice is then added after cooking to help to cool the food and provide that remaining water. Yay! A new cool toy! Blast chillers do exactly what it sounds like they do. They blast cold air across food at high speeds to remove heat. They are typically used to cool large amounts of food. They are ridiculously expensive, and I desperately want one for my kitchen. So if you know someone with $35,000 laying around, talk them into buying us that blast chiller in the picture. It will cool a tray of hot mashed potatoes from 190 degrees Fahrenheit to 41 degrees Fahrenheit in less than an hour, which is just cool. So you thawed, you prepped, you cooked, and you chilled your food safely. Congratulations! Now we have to store it safely, and then we have to reheat it. To safely store your food that is still chilling, loosely cover the food containers before storing them. In fact, food can be left uncovered if it's stored in a way that prevents contaminants from dripping into it. Storing uncovered containers above other food, especially raw seafood, meat, and poultry, it will definitely help prevent cross-contamination. And now it's finally time. We're going to serve that food. You have thawed it, prepped it, cooked it, chilled it, and stored it. Good. I'm starving. How you reheat your food depends entirely on how you intend to serve your food. If you are reheating ready-to-eat food that's going to be served right away, like a beef or a beef sandwich, you can warm it to any temperature you want. However, you must make sure the food was cooked and cooled correctly. In other words, once a hamburger has been cooked, it could be served cold as long as you did everything else exactly right. I don't know why you'd want to eat a cold hamburger, but you could. A more obvious example is pizza. Is there anything better than cold pizza? A restaurant can rewarm pizza to any temperature, even serve it lukewarm or cold, as long as they're going to serve it right away. But generally speaking, restaurants are not going to serve pre-cooked food cold. They're going to heat it to a holding temperature and then serve it from a steam table or other hot holding device. Remember the poultry page, how I said we would come back to reheating previously cooked food? Well, we're there, baby. If you are going to hold hot food for later service, you must heat that TCS food to an internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds. Make sure the food reaches this temperature within two hours from start to finish. The food handler in the photo is uh, reheating soup for hot holding. These guidelines apply to all reheating methods, such as ovens, fryers, ranges, even microwave ovens. If you're working with pre-cooked, commercially processed and packaged, ready-to-eat foods, you only need to warm them to an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit. That includes items like, you know, mozzarella cheese sticks or deep-fried vegetables. We're ending this chapter by talking about what you should tell your customers when you don't follow temperature guidelines on purpose. Think about like hamburgers and steaks. Nobody wants one of those cooked to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be well done, and that's disgusting. What about raw oysters? Sushi, grilled, medium rare salmon. All of these things can be served if you take certain precautions. But you also have to tell the people who are eating at your restaurant that what they are ordering could potentially kill them. That's just being nice. 
The way we communicate the potential danger of breaking the rules on cooking temperatures is through something called a consumer advisory. Consumer advisories come in two forms, disclosures and reminders. If your menu includes TCS items that are raw or undercooked, such as animal products, you must disclose it on the menu next to these items. This is usually done by placing an asterisk next to the item that points customers to a footnote at the bottom of the menu. The footnote must include a statement that indicates that the item is raw or undercooked, or contains raw or undercooked ingredients. Here's an example of a disclosure. The asterisk next to the menu item points the customer to the disclosure at the bottom of the page. Remember, a disclosure tells the customer that this particular menu item includes raw or undercooked food. On the other hand, a consumer advisory reminder tells customers in general that eating raw or undercooked items has certain risks. Reminders don't warn customers about a specific food, but about the dangers of eating raw food in general. The same menu has an example of a reminder at the very bottom of the page, right there. So now you know. Reminders advise customers who order raw or undercooked TCS foods, such as animal products, of the increased risk of foodborne illness. In addition to posting a notice in your menu, you can also provide this information using brochures or table tents or a sign. I like signs. This sign here is an example of a post-it reminder. Stick it up on your wall and you have satisfied the law. Two last things about potentially dangerous foods. The Food and Drug Administration advises against offering raw or undercooked meat, poultry, seafood, or eggs on children's menus at all. This is especially true for undercooked ground beef. Rare, medium rare, and medium hamburgers, they may be potentially contaminated with Shiga toxin-producing E. coli, and you shouldn't uh, serve kids that. That would be bad. On the other end of the spectrum, older diners require special precautions as well. If you're in an operation that serves a high-risk population, such as nursing homes or daycare centers, you cannot ever serve certain things. You can never serve raw seed sprouts, raw or uncooked, unpasteurized eggs, meat, or seafood. And you're certainly not going to give them unpasteurized milk or unpasteurized juice because that's just dangerous. But you knew that. That's from the first part of this chapter. Okay, we've covered the ways to prevent cross-contamination and time temperature abuse while preparing food, the correct way to thaw food, the minimum internal temperatures for cooking food safely, and how to cool and reheat food within the correct amount of time. It's a long chapter, so thanks for sticking it out. I appreciate you. But look at you go. <laughs> you know everything you need to be successful on the Serve Safe test. Mostly. As long as it only is going to ask you questions about Chapter 6. There are lots of details in this chapter. Lots of things that you're going to have to memorize, and a few concepts that you're going to have to learn. In general, with Chapter 6, success is based on repetition. Repetition is your friend. Go over the material several times, watch the videos more than once, read the chapter, and get to studying those temperature guidelines, and you're going to knock this one out. I promise. All right, everybody. See you next time.